If you want to, first of all, turn to Genesis. Genesis chapter 12. I know I'm not speaking on that, but if you get your finger into Genesis chapter 12, and that's where we'll be starting off. Now, all saints, we're going through quite a lot of changes because they're losing the vicar, i.e. me, in January. And the place is a bit in turmoil. We've had quite a lot of growth, unusual places you get growth from. Reading band certificates, I never expected somebody to come to the church and read a band certificate to get married. It always just seems the thing that the Anglicans do. Funerals. We've had people come in new to the church through funerals. And also for the outreach activities. So it's been a wonderful place and it's been lovely to see God doing his stuff. But now we're at a new stage because with the, the vicar leaving, they need to run themselves. This is going to be the only church in Southport that will have to run themselves. So it's getting the leadership trained up. But in some ways that could be more healthy, isn't it? Because you're not reliant on one person at the front, but it's the whole body of the church that works together. And in some ways that's where you're at, isn't it, now in the interregnum. So lots of change for you. Wondering what your new vicar's going to be like. Wondering if they'll lead in the right direction that you want to. And a bit of nervousness probably as well. And that's just the church. What's happening in your own lives, I don't know. But in this time of change, I think it's good to do a spiritual check. And just come before God and say, here I am. Here I am. And when I did that, I said, God... What is next? And he said, well, preach the kingdom, <coughs> preach the gospel. And I said, well, we do that. We know that Jesus loves us. We know that he died for us. We want to be part of his body. And he says, we do it, but now I want you to really do it. You do it, but now I want you to really do it. And I think that's a challenge for us all. Where are we at with God? Is our, has our faith become superficial? Or have we got our eyes on God? And are we seeing where he directs? Now, I, to me, the basic borderline um, ground stone, whatever you call it, of Christianity is that God is love. If you read in John 24, it says, the Father loved the Son before the creation of the world. Have you got that? The Father loved the Son before the creation of the world. God's love is perfect. We're in progress. But God's love is perfect. And I want you to hold on to that as we go into Abraham. So can I have somebody just read very loudly, chapter 12, up to the end of verse 4. Chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. Could somebody be brave enough to read those verses? Come on, Christ Church. <laughs> Thank you, John. The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham left, as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Thank you. <coughs> In this circle, we've got three points. First one, a good Methodist. First one is knowing, to know God. To know God. And obviously, Abraham knew God. And he was obedient to him. It isn't every day you pack up everything. Your animals, you take your wife, you leave the country, and you just set off. That takes a lot of trust, doesn't it? Which shows that Abraham knew God. Abraham knew him. Would you do that if Joe Bloggs asked you to do it? No. But if somebody you loved challenged you to do that, you'd feel safe, wouldn't you? You'd feel, I can do this, this is what God wants me to do, because his eyes are focused on God himself. 
He's like so full of what God can do. <coughs> yeah, I'll do that. So he goes on and starts on his journey. And, I, and that is quite important for this. Because if you've got a strong relationship with someone, you will do anything. And what I'm trying to say to you today is God loves you. He has got the best for you. Abraham was willing to leave things that were precious to him to set off. He was 75 years of age at this point. And then when we go on later to the chapter of today, he is, um, oh, sorry, the chapter before, when he has Isaac, he's 100. So from setting off from air to having Isaac is 25 years. And he has this son that he has been wanting for so long, that Sarah's been wanting for so long. As, as Jane prayed in the prayers, he made lots of mistakes along the way. He pretended his wife wasn't his wife. He'd slept with, with Hagar and had Ishmael and tried to fix it for himself. Don't we try and fix things for ourselves? Or is it just me? You fix things for yourself, don't you? And we get in messes, don't we? But God doesn't give up on us, and God fulfilled his promise. Because there he is, at a hundred, giving birth to Isaac, as God had promised. And I think that's, that's quite exciting. The fact that he fulfilled his promise. And Isaac, can you waiting for a child for 25 years? He was desperate for this child. And he has this wonderful child. And then what does God do? Sometimes you think that's typical of God, isn't it? You get what you're really meant to be going, you've got there, and then he asks you to give it up. And you think, what's all that about? What is all that about? But fortunately, Abraham had more faith than me, because he knew God wouldn't let him down. I remember when I went to see a lady called Sue Proctor that used to go to this church. She became a Christian through the Alpha Course, and then the, the Saturday after she got diagnosed as having cancer, and I was so angry with God because I thought he'd let me down. And then when I spoke to her, she says, no, Sonia, I'm happy because now I love life, but I can love death as well. Her eyes were focused on Jesus, so it didn't matter to her where, where it ended up because she was so focused on Jesus. She's with him in glory now. But it's that thing of keeping your eyes on him and trusting him. Even when it's all uncertain out there, even when you feel like you're drowning out there, when circumstances aren't what you expect, it's keeping firm and trusting in Jesus, knowing him. Because that love that God has for each of us is real. And he will bring us through each situation as long as we're focused on him. And it's interesting how this passage develops. Because at the time when Abraham is asked to take Isaac, he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. Early in the morning, I sometimes think when he's trying to sneak out before Sarah saw him, <laughs> especially if he knew what was going on. But he was obedient. But there's a lot more to this passage than meets the eye. Because this passage is a parallel <coughs> to the coming of Jesus. In fact, in the Old Testament, there's 300 passages that all point to Jesus. And this is a very special passage because it's talking about God's love. It's talking about God's provision when things are difficult. If you notice, he goes out heading towards Moriah. Moriah is where Jerusalem is built. In fact, if you look at 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, it says that Solomon built the temple um, after David wanted it to be built, and there it was in Moriah. So you've got the sacrifices that happened in Jerusalem, and then you've got the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. So you see where this is going. It's a prophecy to Jesus dying for us. Isaac was made to carry the wood. The wood would have been heavy. The rabbis put him at 
37 in the song. I often thought it was a little boy. I think it's because in the picture books he's a little boy. And Josephus, the, the Ju Ju Judaism philosopher, theologian, historian even, says that he was 25. <laughs> Whatever, they say he was a teenager because he couldn't have the physical strength to carry the wood to Moriah and then up the hill. Notice again in this passage that it's a miraculous birth, wasn't it? Isaac was a miraculous birth. Jesus is a miraculous birth. In the passage it says, your beloved only son. He wasn't the only son. There was Ishmael. But it's only son, again, to associate with Jesus. And in that passage where it says, my beloved only son, in the Old Testament, that's the first passage where God's love is mentioned. As saying, his, sorry, the love of Abraham for Isaac is mentioned. And in the baptism of Jesus, again, my beloved son. So you've got the first time in the Old Testament love is mentioned is with Abraham. The second, the first time in the New Testament is with Jesus. So you've got that parallel again. The fact that he carried the wood, Jesus carried the cross. The fact that he got to the sacrifice and then he was about to sacrifice him. Some believe because of the age of Isaac that he offered himself, just like Jesus offered himself. So he's on, on, on the platter to be sacrificed and God says no. And he pulls a ram out of the thicket. And what's a thicket? It's like crowns of thorns. Again, symbolising Jesus. So what you see in this passage is Abraham's obedience, despite the most tough circumstances, he trusted God. Verse 4, he actually said to the people that went with him, I'm coming back, me and my son will come back. He knew that God had the power either to bring him back to life after he'd been healed, <coughs> Or that God would provide. And then we see the parallels of Jesus, the one who's going to save us all. So we see God's love. Are you following this? You're not asleep? <laughs> Good. I know it's a lot of theology, really, but it's quite important to know about Jesus because the whole New Testament Bible is all focused to Jesus. And that's what we're here for today. So you know that you're loved by Jesus. Do you know you're loved by Jesus? Yes. Good. Because this is it. Guys, this is it. This is the crux of our faith. This Old Testament passage, all those years before, is now saying Jesus is coming. Because he loves you. Because he's, they've loved each other since the creation of the world, and now they're coming to love you. And this is all prophesied. It's not haphazard. So God's love has been poured out through this passage. And his provision. Do not think God won't let you down. That God will let you down. He provides, not always in the way we expect. I've had some real earache with God and, and given him what for when things don't go the way that I want it to go. Have you? When I didn't have a job come January, I said, God, what are you playing at? <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. I feel right to, to stay in this area. You're saying you, there's no job. But I know, without a doubt, that God will have his purpose. And I heard something over the last few weeks that actually put a light on in an area I did not expect. And isn't that true in life? You can have things happen and you think, this is the pits. This is the worst thing that can happen yet. How am I going to get out of this one? Something's happened to my family. I, I don't know what I'm doing with my job. I'm suffering from anxiety, which can be very real. And you think, I, I, don't, I can't see a way out of this. But God is there. God is there and he will not let you go. He provides, even if it's at the last minute. <coughs> it's my justification that for doing things on the last minute. <laughs> I say, if God does it at the last minute, then I can too. <laughs> but he did at the last minute. He says, stop Abraham. And he gives him the ram. So go out of this place today looking at Jesus, look in his eyes, have your faith made stronger, let him meet you in your areas of need. He's concerned about you, he loves you, he wants you to be complete and to be strong, he wants
wants you to trust him. Hold on to that wonderful love. Don't lose focus. Because the world can be very distracting and very depressing at times. But God has promised he will not leave you or forsake you. And it's all been planned from the beginning of time to the end. And I feel now God needs his church to arise. <coughs> to have that love that he's got. To go out and minister to people. Show them his love. Show them that there's hope. New day, new hope, is what your signpost says. <laughs> you are the advocates of that. Let God meet you. Then you go out and show that new day, new hope to other people. Because that's what God delights in. So Father, we pray now that you will bring that hope. You will bring that assurance that our eyes will be on you, whatever our circumstances, that we will just be in love with you, that we will just follow you, that we will know your help and your support, whatever's happening in our lives, and that we will trust you like Abraham, and that we will see your love be spread forth in this culture. We ask this in your name. Amen.